Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Atheist Alliance International Podcast. I'm your host, Jason, a.k.a. Diogenes of Mayberry. Just before we get started, I would like to remind everyone to please like and subscribe. So today I'm joined by a very special guest, uh, retired Yale professor John Collins, who, and let me read your title, Holmes Professor of Old Testament Criticism and Interpretation. So uh, I would like to introduce John and thank him for coming on because his work has been instrumental in my own. Uh, I know I don't talk a lot about my own work when I'm on the podcast, but uh, uh, for those of you who may not know, I wrote a book uh, called Manifest Insanity 10 years ago that details uh, sort of the arguments that the evangelical Christians like to put forth, like creationism. And John's books were very, very helpful to me uh, in my Old Testament chapter for a number of reasons. Um, and then I did an update again uh, two, three years ago, and I reached out to him about um, messianism, because, you know, we always hear what Christians think are the messianic um, uh, passages in the Bible, uh, but I thought, okay, well, what do the Jews? And so I reached out to John, and he was very helpful. So I will shut up now and introduce John. So John, thank you for joining us. I'm really glad uh, you were you're able to come on. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. So John, uh, as I said, you've re he's retired now, but he was the Old Testament <laughs> professor at, at Yale. Um, he's written a number of books on the topic. Um, maybe just uh, quickly, you, you said you've just turned in a new book uh, on the, the, the Dead Sea community, the Qumran community. Maybe just a, a quick intro to that would be, would be interesting. Well, that's actually a comment of phrase, should say, for instance. Maybe not everybody is familiar with the Dead Sea Scrolls, but okay. one of the first text found in the Dead Sea Scrolls was a rule for a community. And uh, at the time it was called the Manual of Discipline. But it was striking because it looked an awful lot like a, a monastic rule. And one of the oddities of it was it didn't mention women or children. And it was on the basis of that document especially that people decided that the people who had these scrolls were the Essenes, uh, because at least on some accounts, these were supposed to have been celibate. But it's a rule for a community, and this is a commentary for a series with Oxford University Press. And so, you know, it's a lot of technical stuff, explaining words, explaining some of the ideas, and incidentally, you know, giving my views of how this community formed and what it was about. Okay, so is it still thought that the Essenes were the Qumran community, or is there some dispute yeah. there now? Well, there is some dispute, but I still think so. Um, I, I'm quite convinced that they were. Uh, I think, you know, to say that they were not is just to multiply entities without cause. Uh, because okay. They have enough in common with the Essenes. Now, to be sure, you know, there are some problems. Um, for example, the scrolls never say that people should be celibate. And people have made a reasonable objection that if you want people to be celibate, you ought to tell them explicitly. But at the same time, you've got to weigh that against the fact that this rule doesn't mention women or children at all even though these people were obsessed with purity and purity issues come up a lot in, in relation to women. So, you know, I think in fact, uh, you know, the Essenes were not all celibate, but I think they did have a celibate component and I think that does make sense in the context. Okay, so was this community then largely just the, the Essenes, or would there have been a larger community of women and children there, you think, as well? Well, as I understand it, you know, there, there is also another rule book called the Damascus Document that was actually found in the Cairo Gnidza back at the end of the 19th century, and then copies of that were also found at Qumran. Now, the Damascus Document describes a new covenant. People who joined this new covenant did so in as families. And they, they, it was, remained a family-based organization. And, you know, they had 
multiple, they were spread all over the land. Now, at some point in the development of it, and we do not have a good historical account in the scrolls, but at some point, a group of them decided that they needed something more, something more spiritual, if you like. And some of these people picked up and went off to the desert to Qumran. Now, I think this, uh, I would say this elite community, this more elite community, wasn't all at Qumran. You know, it, they still had multiple settlements with a quorum of ten, what's called a minyan in, in Judaism. Um, okay. But so they had multiple communities like that. But I think the one at Qumran was one of them, and it may have been the most elite of them and they thought they were atoning for the land and because of that you know, they lived uh, they aspire to a higher degree of purity and of holiness than anybody else okay and in in the book you sent me uh you kindly sent me a copy a pdf copy of your book the scepter and the star and if i remember correctly the subtitle of that was messianism in the dead sea scrolls Indeed. So was was this was this a major aspect of this community that they were they were expecting the end times or the, well, it was just messianism certain, in general? Yeah, they were certainly expecting the end times, uh, and they certainly were expecting actually two messiahs, at least two messiahs: a messiah of Aaron and a messiah of Israel. Now, this was different from standard Jewish expectation. But to back up a little bit, you know, basically, Messiah means anointed. If you get the word used without further qualification, it normally refers to the king. In the older parts of the Hebrew Bible, it referred to the king of the day and wasn't a future figure at all. But then, According to the book of Samuel, God had promised David that his dynasty would always reign on the throne in Jerusalem. And they did reign for a long time, for several hundred years. But then the Babylonians came along and put an end to it. And then you actually have, a, at the end of the Babylonian exile, there's a brief period when there was hope that the Davidic monarchy would be restored. But that didn't work out. And then I think the whole idea kind of went into abeyance. Now, people still had the text of the book of Samuel. They still figured that God had promised this to David. So if it isn't the case now, it must be going to come in the future. But I don't think people were sitting around waiting for that to happen. At the time of the Maccabean revolt, which was in the 160s BC, uh, not a word about a messiah. Now, then two things happened after that. First of all, after the Maccabean revolt, the successors of the Maccabees, the Hasmoneans, took over in Jerusalem. First, they took over the high priesthood, and then they declared themselves kings. This was only done formally at the end of the second century BC, uh, they had probably been acting like kings for a while before that. Now, this offended some more pious Jews who said, God didn't promise this to the Hasmoneans. They have no right to do this. And then the other thing that uh, helped revive the idea of uh, a messiah was when the Romans took over. And it was the combination of these things. I think that the initial impetus for reviving Messianism was really uh, complaining about the Hasmoneans. And this was also partly why you had the expectation of two messiahs, a priestly messiah and a royal messiah. And the point of that was, these are two jobs, not one. Whereas the, the Hasmoneans combined them. And so what they were saying is, no, when God sets things right, you should have two rulers. You should have a temporal ruler and a priestly ruler. They also talk uh, occasionally about a prophet, but they don't 
the, the picture of the prophet isn't nearly so clear. Now, okay. And they so had you... the job of the royal Messiah, the Messiah of Israel, was primarily uh, military. I would think of him like, if you're familiar with American football, a blocking back. This is a position that has more or less stayed out in contemporary American football. But 40 years ago, it was common to have a fullback whose main job was just to knock people out of the way of the person with the ball. Now, I think that's largely what the Davidic royal messiah was expected to do. And then it's the priestly messiah who would really run the show. That, I think, right. is the idea in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay. So just, just to back up a little bit. So I was looking through my notes on Scepter and the Star. And it, <clears throat> forgive me if I mispronounce it, Z Zerubbabel? Am I saying that right? Zerubbabel. The, Zerubbabel. Put the, so, put the emphasis on the ub. Ub. So at Zerubbabel. the time of Cyrus, Cyrus the Great frees the Jews in Babylon. And yeah. Zerubbabel is the, is the Davidic heir who returns. And there is some messianic hope that he will take this position but it doesn't seem like he was really interested and it was really only two books i believe it was haggai and zechariah that That's really true. sort of make this point that you know they had the pin these messianic hopes that the the davidic dynasty would be restored and then as you mentioned it pretty much dies off throughout the second temple period and really only resurrects uh, around the beginning of the the first century bce uh, because of the the reaction to the Hasmoneans and and the Romans, that's right. Okay, and so what's interesting is it sort of gets projected back that people think that this messianic uh, call or desire is is consistent throughout the Second Temple period, but as you mentioned, it's pretty much dormant for for most of the period, and then. Um, you mentioned Second Samuel, where the, it was promised that the, the, it would always be the Davidic dynasty, and I believe it was you that pointed out that there's a passage in Mark, and I forget the I forget the chapter and verse mm -hmm. um, that Mark in in Mark Jesus points out that it was the scribes who had essentially resurrected that passage from Second Samuel to say, hey, the the Hasmoneans can't be can't be um, the the, the kings because this was promised to an heir of David and so they they kind of resurrected that uh, that idea that this would have to be someone which would obviously would would need God's intervention to reconstitute the Davidic line which had had fizzled out Is that that's correct okay, just to back up there a little bit the text that does that most clearly is a text called the Psalms of Solomon which was written in the middle of the first century. BCE. And uh, this was really at the time when the Romans came in and put an end to the Hasmonean dynasty. And at that point, we think there were probably Pharisees uh, who, who were saying this, you know, that God didn't make a promise to those people. They were usurpers. So that's, I'd say, the clearest criticism of it. I think that same criticism is implied in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, it's not the case then that people invented the idea of a Messiah in this period of the first century BCE, because, you know, there were several prophetic oracles that were quite old. And, um, you know, the branch of David that, that we have in, in the book of Jeremiah, it's a great passage in uh, Isaiah chapter 11. Some of these oracles may even go back to a time when there was a monarchy and they were looking for, forward, you know, to a king who would be the perfectly just king and would rule forever. And then there are a number of them that we're not sure when they were written and they may well have come from the early Second Temple period. Uh, so there were prophecies on the books, so to speak. But there was an, it's really only in the first century BCE and after that, that people began to take it seriously and actually okay. think about this as something that might actually happen. Okay. And then you mentioned in your, in your book 
that there's actually four messianic paradigms and you mentioned two of them two or three so the priest the the king the prophet which someone like moses and then the heavenly messiah which is where we that comes in through daniel right which is the archangel michael mentioned in daniel 12. that's right and in daniel 7 you have one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven right and i think in the context of daniel that was the archangel michael you know so a heavenly deliverer but by the first century of the common era at least the assumption was that that figure was a messiah uh, we have a text a very controversial text called the similitudes of enoch that only survives in ethiopic and is only found in manuscripts from the middle ages but many of us think this actually comes from around the time of christ and that takes the figure in Daniel and refers to him as my Messiah, but he's a heavenly figure and he presides at a judgment. He doesn't actually come on earth. Now, in uh, by the end of the first century, we have another Jewish text called Fourth Ezra, which uh, says, you know, that this figure will come on the clouds and will then defeat all his enemies which is, in fact, rather similar to what you get in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation. Um, now, you know, as I argue in, in the scepter and the star, the puzzle about Jesus and Messianism is not why people didn't accept him. It's why anybody thought he was. Because the Messiah, you know, that we're not talking about the priest, the Messiah here, now we're talking about about the Messiah of Israel, if you like. And he was always expected to be a militant figure. Despite an occasional attempt to turn Jesus into a revolutionary, the, the evidence just isn't there for that. You know, Jesus, in fact, seems to have been a quite, quite a different kind of person. And I think what happened with Jesus was that he went around saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. And now you can argue forever as to just what he meant by that. But it was largely, I think, a, a style of life. I think it meant the rule of God, you know, living in accordance with the will of God, if you like. It was something like that, I think, more than a political kingdom in the case of Jesus. Yeah. But so all, all, of, all of that came later. Like as All Jesus' that, story evolves. It, 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 some of it actually came then with his, his disciples in his own time. Because if you go around saying the kingdom of God is at hand, people will think that you're going to bring it or have something to do with it. And his followers evidently got excited. If the story of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem is historical, and I think it probably is because... We have a lot of incidents like that in the first century of people who were having acting out something as a symbolic action. And I think Jesus riding on a donkey into Jerusalem symbolized the, the coming of the Messiah. And this, I think, is basically why he was crucified. The Romans weren't taking any chances on that. But obviously, he didn't overthrow the Romans, and he didn't reestablish the kingdom of Israel. And so the, the answer to that in the New Testament is, well, he'll come back and he'll do the job right the next time. So what we're seeing then is, is Messianism has, has evolved. So from the, the original Babylonian exile for return of the Davidic dynasty to it goes dormant to it evolves into the priestly the kingly, the prophet, and then the heavenly. So when it's not happening by man-made nature, it, it morphs into, all right, the, the messianic call becomes the heavenly messiah, Michael will, God will send Michael to, to do this. And then later when Jesus talks about the son of man coming, it be, and he's talking about the coming of the kingdom, it becomes assumed that he's referring to himself and not to, to Michael in the book of Daniel. That, I think, is, is more or less right. Now, an important step in that, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, with the idea of a priestly messiah, 
main job of a priest is to atone for sin. And that, I think, is where the idea comes in that the Messiah, a Messiah, uh, should atone for sin. Now, in the epistle to the Hebrews in the New Testament, they even cast Jesus as a heavenly high priest. But that, I think, comes from the idea that his death was an atoning sacrifice. And you know, then they pick up, there's a prophet, prophecy in uh, the book of Isaiah of the suffering servant and uh, this becomes another messianic paradigm but it's one that only arises within Christianity correct of the, the Messiah as somebody who atones for sin right and that's that's why I reached out to you because we always hear about what the Christian version of the messianic passages are like the suffering servant and I wanted to know okay so what are the passages that to the Jews legitimately considered messianic, which you, you cover uh, in the Scepter and the Star, which we mentioned earlier, really only occur in the two books of Haggai and, and Zechariah, a couple of passages in, in Jeremiah, um, and maybe there's the, the, the uh, Isaiah 11, which is considered yes. to be a little bit of a forgery, not maybe not a forgery, but a later insertion that doesn't really yeah. belong in, in that yeah. era. Yeah. Okay. There's one that I like in the book of Numbers, Balaam's prophecy about a scepter and a star and what the scepter will do is smash the heads of the enemies. Now that one was very popular in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was something they wanted to see happen. But this was a strand you know, of messianism that Jesus didn't seem to have any great interest in. Yeah, well, and as you said, like you can argue for days about when or what he meant and who he was so there's lots of competing yeah. theories so but he was obviously if he was calling for the kingdom in his lifetime it's obviously or overthrowing the romans it obviously didn't happen so okay and so yeah. one of one of your other books that was extremely helpful to me was the the short introduction to the hebrew bible which for anybody who's who i think wants to understand the old testament and i i I harp on this word nonstop is context. That if you do not understand the context in which a lot of these passages were composed, you miss the thread completely. Uh, and that's where your book, The Short Introduction, I think is masterful that you, you really go into a, a, an incredible breakdown on, on what these passages mean. Um, one of the ones that stands out for me is the, um, the foundation narrative of the Exodus. So maybe you could just talk briefly about how that was where that comes from and how they, they grounded that in, in the Passover festivals. Yes, uh, I might add in passing, there is a long introduction too. You know, I originally okay. wrote a much longer book and then, then I wrote the short one because the, the long one is a bit too much for, for a lot of people. And it is in fact something now, one of, the, one of my remaining tasks I think is to do a final edition of that introduction. But to come back to the Exodus, you know, one of the big shocks that people get when they study Old Testament at a place like Yale, uh, or any place, you know, that teaches historical criticism, is the, the idea that a lot of key events didn't happen. Now, in the, the Exodus is, is very much bound up with the conquest, because the simple form of the story, although what you actually have in the Bible is much more complicated, but the simple form is the, the sons of Jacob went down into Egypt, were enslaved there, and then the Exodus is their liberation out of Egypt. And then as the story goes, when they go out into the wilderness, then they form themselves into an army and eventually invade the land of Canaan which supposedly had been promised to them. And this, in fact, has become maybe the most controversial episode in all of the Old Testament uh, in, in recent years, because it's a paradigm for colonial conquest. But before you get to that, what if the, with the conquest especially, people figured reasonably that if you dug up the sites you should find some evidence of it. Because 
There they are all over the uh, that part of the world. There are mounds that we call tells. Some of them look like flat-topped mountains. And these got to be that way because cities were built on hills. They were destroyed, leveled off, built on top of that, le destroyed, leveled off. You know, you have sometimes as many as seven layers of destruction in some of those places. Now, uh, the conclusion of the archaeologists, and archaeologists are not infallible, and who knows, maybe next year somebody will make some new discovery. But the conclusion of the archaeologists at, for the last 50 years or so is that Jericho wasn't inhabited at the time uh, when the exodus was supposed to have happened. Now, that kind of then casts doubt on the nature of all of that story. Another finding of archaeologists was that there was very little evidence, practically no evidence, that the people who moved into what we call Israel had been in Egypt. If they had been, you would expect them to bring Egyptian pottery. Pottery is one of the main things archaeologists use you know, as evidence for cultural change and the like. And there, there, is a, there are huge quantities of pottery that can be found if you dig anywhere in Israel. But not Egyptian pottery. And, you know, there just isn't evidence of the kind of influence of uh, uh, Egyptian influence that you would expect if the story of the Exodus were true. Now, of course, when you stop and think about it, the story of the Exodus uh, kind of strains credibility at points. I think it was Harold Kushner, it was the, the book, um, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, uh, has the story of the, the Jewish kid who comes home and says he has been, been told, he just heard the story about the Exodus. And they say, well, what did you hear? And he say, well, they were, the Israelites were trapped up against the Dead Sea. And then the Israeli army came in and bombed the Egyptians. And the parent says, did they tell you that? And he said, no, but if I told it to you the way they told it, who'd believe it? And, you know, it's not, it's not the story as you get it in the Bible isn't kind of realistic historical narrative. Now, it's highly unrealistic that a pharaoh would go off in pursuit of runaway slaves. Pharaohs didn't put themselves at risk like that. Uh, and, you know, if you had uh, enough people coming out, now I'm sure there was some historical basis to the story of the Exodus. I'm sure there were Hebrews who had been slaves in Egypt and who escaped and who, who came out of it. But if you had a mass movement like that, you would expect to have some historical evidence for it. And we just don't. So it seems quite likely that this is a myth. And myth is not a bad thing. In fact, myths are great things. Myths are imaginative stories. But this was a foundation narrative uh, my own suspicion on that is that this was developed in the Northern Kingdom of Israel. The man who founded the Northern Kingdom of Israel, who broke away from Solomon, after Solomon's death, I should say, broke a split from Solomon's son, uh, had himself been in exile in Egypt. And my guess is that it was in his time, probably, that this story was developed it was then much more important in northern Israel than it ever was in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, the idea of the promise to David was much more important. Okay. So, and you know, I think students always kind of find that a bit deflating. But, but, you know, that isn't really, to my mind, the problem with the Exodus. Because the Exodus is a great story. And an inspiring story, and lots of people have found it inspiring. And, you know, we can talk or think as to whether a story has to be true to be really inspiring, but I would say obviously not. Lots of the stories that have inspired people 
are very likely myths, you know, imaginative stories. Much bigger problem with the Exodus is whether you can say that people had a God-given right to invade land that was occupied by other people. And that's the that argument that they're still people. using, or some of them in the state, the modern state of Israel are still using that argument. Like, they yeah, are, it was and, promised to them. and also, you know, you talk there uh, at the beginning about uh, the, the right-wing Protestants in the U.S., and often some of those people are as militant as any Zionist in, in Israel. And I think that that is deeply troubling. That's the, that is a problem. Indeed. So you you mentioned in in the the introduction that the the Passover was actually a, a spring festival, right? A festival of the yeah. shepherds. And, yeah. No. And so they they yeah. basically co opt that festival and, and tie it to the foundation narrative. Yeah, I think that kind of thing, you know, is very, very common with the origin of religious festivals. Uh, the, the cultic calendar that you get in the Bible in ancient Israel was basically uh, an agricultural calendar. You know, you had festivals of the spring, you had festivals of the harvest, of the ingathering, that kind of thing. Um, and then that the, you get some attempt, but mainly with the Passover, to integrate that into the story of the Exodus so that it becomes, uh, that you combine the celebration of the, the liberation from Egypt with the, the Passover. But I would think the probable explanation of the Passover is that when you first, you get the first lambs in the spring, that's an occasion for celebrating. It's a first fruits kind of uh, thing. It's the same with the harvest festival in the fall. You know, in uh, the book of Deuteronomy, they say, when you come into the land and then when you get the fruit, you should go to the, the, the place that the Lord has designated. And it's a Thanksgiving festival, basically, that you give back to God some of the good things you have received. And it's a way of acknowledging that these things are a gift from God. I think that's so. What, what What are some of the more interesting stories to you? Like you say, like the, some of these stories shocked the students. But when when you were learning, what was something that maybe stood out that really shocked you? Uh, you know, uh, uh, well, I wasn't brought up as a Bible Christian. I'm an Irish Catholic. We didn't read the Bible very much. We were much more familiar with the parables from the New Testament. Okay. But things like the Pauline epistles, uh, you know, we didn't go there by and large. We weren't focused on the book of Revelation. You know, we had the vague idea of the second coming, and we would have been surprised as hell if it actually happened, needless to say. And that, I think, is probably true of most Christians. Uh, so, you know, it didn't bother me a whole lot to find out that many of these stories were not actually historical. Now, when I was even in graduate school, uh, you know, the big name in biblical scholarship in the early 20th century, up to the middle of the 20th century, was William Foxwell Albright, who taught at Johns Hopkins. He trained most of the really influential professors of Old Testament, including some of my own teachers like Frank Moore Cross. Now, Albright, I think, believed that if you dug in the right place, you would find evidence that the Bible happened. That's maybe putting it a little bit, um, it's oversimplifying it a little bit. The man wasn't uh, a naive fundamentalist by any means. And also, I think Albright was quite capable of recognizing that some evidence that he found didn't support his theory. But the main textbook from which I learned about the Old Testament was John Bright's History of Israel. That was still being used as the introductory textbook at Yale uh, you know, up to a little more than 20 years ago, really till the time when, when I arrived at Yale. 
And, uh, you know, it was a good book. There were a lot of things you could learn about the history of the ancient Near East and a lot about the context. And I think in that telling of it, there was an assumption that the Exodus did happen. And so it's a very gradual loosening of that, I think. And uh, it came mainly from the archaeologists that said, oh, this, this doesn't add up. This, this isn't, isn't convincing. And that was ironic because both Albright himself was an archaeologist and, you know, what, uh, what happened in the 20th century is that people set out with great enthusiasm to prove the historicity of the Bible by archaeology. And a lot of the archaeological digs were financed by Christian seminaries and often by very conservative places. And then... You know, ultimately, it backfired. If your goal was really just to prove that things happen, more often than not, it showed that they probably didn't. Now, at the same time, we learned an enormous amount about the, the world of ancient Israel and the world of the ancient Near East. So I'm not suggesting that the whole enterprise of archaeology was a bust, but it changed. It had to change and it had to change its whole focus. Yeah, there's the saying, the Bible in the one hand and the spade in the other, as they, as they went out right. digging. And, yes. and yes. There, there's a good book, if you have not read it, uh, and for all those of us watching as well, I would recommend it's called The Bible Unearthed uh, by Israel Frankelstein, uh, Finkel, sorry, Finkel, yes. Israel Finkelstein. Uh, yes. And he talks he talks about a lot like where the the Exodus story comes from. He he grounds it in, in 622 BCE during the Deuteronomistic reforms, yes, uh, during think, the time of King that's Josiah. Yeah. <clears throat> but so, now, you see, Finkelstein was kind of the new breed of archaeologist. Uh, but he, he came along, I suppose, the 70s or early 80s, and he did a lot of work in the highlands of Canaan, which was the area where the Israelites supposedly first settled. And it was his work in large part that showed, you know, you don't have any Egyptian influence here. Whoever these people uh, were, they do not seem to have come from outside the land. And so, you know, the current theory, which was largely due to Finkelstein, I think, it was that it was people from the lowlands who fled out of the cities, maybe at the time when the Philistines were invading and went up into the highlands and started over there. Now, there, there was yeah, another the, very- The Bronze Age collapse, right? There's, yeah, there was an influential textbook by Norman Gottwald. I don't know if you ever read it, The Tribes of Yahweh. No. Now, Norman Gottwald was at heart a 60s revolutionary. And he actually dedicated this book to the Viet Cong. And it's a highly yeah. romantic view of uh, the tribes of Yahweh in the highlands and you know he was a good scholar and he did a lot of good anthropological work on how tribes functioned and so forth but his idea was that this was an ideological movement of liberation and i think that's quite unlikely i think it's much more plausible to say that these were people who had for whatever reason found it expedient to get away from the cities get away from the coast get up into the highlands and then when they became strong enough, what do they do? They go out and they get themselves a king. So it wasn't an ideological resistance to monarchy as such. It was just a, a matter of, uh, of temporal necessity. Okay. So if, if something didn't necessarily shock you, is there something you particularly enjoy teaching to your students? And like, you know, this is gonna be something new for them like a, a particularly fascinating insight that you think captures their imagination? Uh, you know, the, the material actually that I probably worked on most, especially in the first half of my career, was apocalyptic literature. And uh, I, you know, my initial interest, uh, I started out in, in high school doing classics. And then I joined a religious order. And I said, I, when it was time to go to the university, I said, I would like to do classics. And they said, well, you can do classics if you also do Hebrew. And then you can teach scripture. 
And that's how I came to be a scripture scholar. It wasn't something I had initially inspired to do. But then my interest was especially in the, the Hellenistic period, the time when the Hebrew tradition uh, met the Greek tradition. And I, I must say, I found this quite fascinating because the Catholic Church in the 1960s was going through something like it, where you had, you know, a very traditional religion that was suddenly being opened up to influences from a very different kind of culture and how you work that out. And so my initial interest was in Hellenistic Judaism, that was Greek-speaking Judaism. Initially, I had wanted to work on the Wisdom of Solomon, which is a great book, I think. Uh, it's in the Catholic Bible, not in the Protestant Bible, but very much influenced by Greek philosophy and Greek rhetoric. Now, when I was at Harvard, uh, then there was the young professor named Paul Hansen, who had just written his dissertation and published it under the title, The Dawn of Apocalyptic. And this became kind of the hot topic of the day. And I had a somewhat different view of the subject than Paul did, because I was interested in the later period. He was really writing about the period right after the Babylonian exile. So I went off and wrote my dissertation on the Greek Sibylline oracles. Now, these, these are not widely read. I regret to say. Looking back at it, I would hesitate now to recommend to a student to write on Greek Sibylline oracles if they want to get a job teaching Bible. <laughs> I think in many cases that's counterproductive. I was lucky it worked out. But that was really what got me into apocalyptic literature. And you see, I find it fascinating. It's great imaginative literature. You know, it, all sorts of things that couldn't possibly happen. Somebody ascending up through the heavens and what they see, and it's a way of imagining the whole universe. So I've always enjoyed very much teaching that. Uh, connecting to your earlier question, you know, was there anything that kind of shocked me? I suppose the, the thing that would have engaged my interest most when I was a student was the whole question of resurrection and afterlife. Because probably the real revelation to me was that this is something that only came into the biblical tradition very late. And that in most of the Old Testament, you don't have that at all. And people got along just fine without it. You know, it's not, uh, it is quite possible to live a moral life and be motivated to live a moral life without believing that there's reward or punishment after death. Yeah, that's so one of the points I, I made. Uh, yeah. you, you had talked about in, in Daniel 12, that this is the first and only time that speaks of a resurrection and that, the, yeah. that basically fundamentally changed the direction mm. that the, the Western world has taken over the last 2000 years, because that idea of an afterlife which was not present in judaism informs both christianity and islam uh, so i found that quite an interesting fact myself uh, yes i'm glad you brought that up uh, because in, uh, in re for the last few years uh, there has been um, what, a kind of movement i don't think it's peculiar to biblical studies i think you might get it elsewhere in the humanities of resistance to speaking of genres and some of this is you know that you must appreciate every individual text it's it's you know we should talk about trees and not about forests now one of the, the point where that concerns me is the distinction between prophecy and apocalypticism and i have colleagues and friends who would say oh it's all prophecy it's all, it's all, you know, divine revelation, whatever. And uh, the, the differences are insignificant. Well, I think the differences are very significant. And this, I would say, is the main point that those people miss, is that once the belief in a judgment of the dead took hold, I think 
it changed things radically. That's a change in world view. Now, you see, uh, you have a lot of people in the modern world who are taught when they're young that there is a heaven and a hell, but then don't really believe that when they grow up. They may continue to pay lip service to it. But, you know, for people who actually believe it, it changes your whole outlook on life. Now, I don't know if you have read what's actually my, my last book, last published book to date, uh, which is What Are Biblical Values? And one of the things that I discuss in that is the, the change in the view of social justice from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And this is something that bothered me a bit, because I think that the main reason probably why the Old Testament is still worth reading and an important collection of writings is there is no other body of literature from the ancient world that puts that kind of emphasis on social justice. In the Hebrew prophets, that's what it's all about. It's not the cult. You know, belief isn't really an issue. Everybody more or less believed in gods in those times, uh, but it's the application of it, a social justice that matters. Now, that isn't nearly as clear in the New Testament. And this becomes a favorite point with many conservative Christian uh, polemicists. It, uh, th there's a man named Hal Lindsay, of whom you may have heard, mm -hmm. who taught at yeah. Dallas Theological Seminary, wrote a book called The Late Great Planet Earth that sold millions of copies. And he was, he allegedly said at one point, God didn't, uh, didn't send me to save the, the fish. He sent me to clean the, uh, he didn't, sorry, I mean, he didn't send me to clean the fishbowl. He sent me to save the fish. <laughs> in other words, we don't have to be concerned about this world. It's all going to go up in flames anyway. Yeah. And you know, there have been famous cases of that. Um, who was the man who was the Secretary for the Interior under Ronald Reagan, who said, you know, I don't know whether it's worth our while trying to preserve forests and the like. We don't know how long there is before Jesus returns. Now, yeah. This, I think, is surely a distortion of the New Testament. I don't think that's what, uh, what Jesus or Paul were really, really thinking of. But you can see how it gives an opening to that kind of thinking. Yeah, because there's a good you meme. Put I... your, okay. you know, if you put your emphasis that way on the, the judgment that is to come and on the next world, uh, it can very well undermine your commitment to this world. Yeah. Now, as so we say, there's, there's there's a... A... yep. Go ahead. Oh yeah, so I was just going to say I've seen a meme. I've seen I've seen it before, but it, it seems to be making the rounds again recently. It says we should stop electing officials that are preparing for the end times. <laughs> well, yes, I think that would probably be a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was I was really intrigued by that that concept of how the you mentioned like the traditional hope in ancient Israel was like to live a long life and to see one's grandchildren and how it radically changed. And before we started recording the, the podcast, uh, we were talking offline about uh, I was I had debated a Baptist pastor uh, in 2016. And the whole topic of the debate was how the thoughts of the afterlife and heaven and hell come very, very late uh, in Second Temple Judaism, uh, like right at sort of the dawn of Christianity. And he's trying to argue, no, 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 it's been there from the beginning. I'm like, no, it's not. You you can't find it. And he's like, oh, if you look at this passage in the Bible, and I'm like, it's not there. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like you you maybe you've you've spent your life as a pastor. You you can just say something to your flock and they believe it. But I'm telling you. So oh, if you look at Deuteronomy, I'm like, it's not there. there like there's it, it is not there no yeah so 
Yeah, and he's he's as as I was mentioning to you, you actually helped me in my rebuttal. I, so I wrote a rebuttal uh, to the the debate where I, I took the quote from you, where he's trying to argue that the Book of Daniel uh, is so is so much later than when it was really written, like during the Maccabean Revolt, as you said in the one sixties BCE. He's like, no, no, yeah. no, because it shows it's up early. in the Dead Sea Scrolls and all. Yeah. Of, he's trying to you muddle and confuse the issue, and it was uh, it was quite yeah. frustrating. So, you know, yeah, there has been an awful lot of wasted effort, and even in some cases, wasted learning, because that there have been many scholars, you know, who learned their Akkadian and their Egyptian and the ancient world, and then were only interested in using that to argue, you know, for the historicity of the Bible. But, you know, if they had just relaxed a bit and looked at the Bible and tried to appreciate what was there, it would have been so much better. Yeah. You have, a, I believe it's in the afterword to the short introduction, uh, a quote that has just really stuck with me through the years, where you said the, it's a, if, I'm, if I'm remembering it correctly, that the, it's a monstrous imposition upon the Bible that you cannot question anything. Because if you read the Old Testament, people are constantly questioning. Like, you know, the whole story of, of Jacob, he's wrestling with God. And yet this idea that we, we just have to accept it and can't yeah. question it is not in the Bible. And, you know, even in the, the New Testament, Jesus says, you heard it was said to them of old, but I say to you. You know, that there is, there is no deference to tradition. I think, you know, there's continuity with tradition, maybe there's respect for tradition, but the, you don't just, uh, you don't just repeat it. Yeah. Well, I like to argue that traditions have a beginning, like, so what happened before okay. this tradition started? So, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thanks for coming on. Uh, it's been a great chat. Uh, any, any parting thoughts or some wisdom you would like to impart to, to any of our viewers that maybe you think they should know or something they could look no, up? Actually, or I think, they I, think I, I touched on some of the, uh, some of the big issues there. Uh, but, you know, I think it's that uh, the Bible remains very much worth reading. But I think, you know, to me, if you read any book, it doesn't matter what it is. You don't just read a book and accept everything it says. This ought to be the purpose of education. You know, Pace, Mr. DeSantis in Florida, what we should be teaching people to do is to think critically. And Unfortunately, uh, that's the opposite of what evangelicals want. They just want people yeah. to believe on faith and not to critically examine. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas I don't think simple belief is ever really a virtue uh, in the Bible or anywhere else. Yeah. Okay. That made you as a parting shot. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's It's been great to have you on. Like we've been corresponding for a little over 10 years now. And I always appreciated your insights, especially if there was something I was, concept I was unsure about. You were always there to, to answer my questions. Your books have been, uh, enormously helpful. Uh, for those of you who would like to read his books, the link will be in the description. You can find a link to his Amazon pages, Amazon page with his books. Some of the ones we've talked about, those books will be there as well. If you're interested in the topics of the Dead Sea Scrolls or understanding the, the historical criticism of the Old Testament, these are great books to read that will uh, inform your, your questions if you have any. So, so great. I really appreciate you coming on, John. It was his Great to, to finally talk to you in person after uh, emailing for, for years. So really appreciate it. Great to meet you too, e yeah. even virtually. Virtually, yes. Yeah. Well, that's the new world. So, Okay, so as we wrap up, we'd like to remind everyone to please like and subscribe. Please do check out John's books. They are well worth reading, especially if if you have been, uh, this being AAI, if you were a Christian and you're, you're still struggling with some of your lingering faith or you have relatives who are, are challenging you, these are great resources. So by all means, check out his stuff. So I'd like to thank everyone for watching and we'll look, we look forward to uh, speaking with everybody and conveying some, some new information to you in the next in upcoming episodes. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.
Okay, thanks for listening. And don't forget, we're on YouTube. So follow us on YouTube. Just search for Atheist Alliance International. And please subscribe and hit that notification bell. We're also on all of your favorite podcast platforms. So make sure that you follow us on there as well. See you next time. Yeah.